Good afternoon. Welcome to the Energy Systems Transition Presentation. I believe we can all agree that the climate crisis is one of the largest crises of the 21st century. There are roundtables, just like the one on the slide, all around the world, where key stakeholders, such as Benoit, the businessman, Ian, the investor, and Polo, as a policymaker, are currently discussing how to meet environmental targets. Environmental targets, such as the IPCC 1.5, degree reduction target and the net zero target by 2050 here in the UK. As graduates from the Master of Sustainable Energy Future in Imperial College, we want to contribute to this conversation and explain how with our research we can contribute to meet these environmental targets. Our research is human-centered and holistic as it touches upon financial, social and technical aspects. Now each of the team members will explain their research. In particular, I looked into electricity market design and policy, aiming to answer the question, do electricity market rules need to change to accommodate raising share of renewables? Environmental policies have led to a rise of renewable energy penetration, as is shown in the figure to the left. However, to continue to allow this renewable expansion, market arrangements and policies need to develop, as if this doesn't happen, issues can arise that I've tried to illustrate with the figures to the right. Firstly, the wholesale price would decrease, as the supply curve would shift to the right. The price would go from the one in orange to the one in dark blue. The electricity price will also vary with the extreme prices it the range of extreme prices increases as shown in the figure. Also, the revenue that renewable projects would receive would decrease. The figure shows an example for Spain and solar PV in orange. Finally, the ancillary services costs will also increase, as can be seen in the red sections of the bar chart. Having to develop the electricity market design and policy arrangements gives us an opportunity to step in the right direction towards meeting environmental targets. In my research, I look into the different possibilities. I've illustrated two in this uh, slide. The first one would be having a CFD floor price, as can be seen in the figure on top. Another alternative I looked into would be to adapting the current capacity, uh, capacity market arrangements that are implemented in many European countries, so that innovative technologies that are storage can be integrated into the market and entry barriers are removed. Many other alternatives are described in the research. Adapting the electricity market design and arrangements is key for policymakers such as Polo as it would be essential to meet environmental targets as it allows renewables to continue expanding and uh, the integration of flexibility assets. It's also very important for businessmen such as Benoit, as current existing businesses will may have to adapt to the uh, energy transition. And it's also very important for new innovative businesses, such as the success of their business case will depend on their understanding of this development. And now having explained the role that electricity market design and policy will have in, achieve, in achieving environmental targets, Abbas will explain the role of heating. Thank you, Elisa. My project aims to find the size of value in decarbonizing heat specific to the UK. So the UK energy system faces a significant challenge in its heat decarbonization agenda. Here's why. Heating in buildings and industries contributes towards 37% of total UK greenhouse gas emissions, primarily due to the use of natural gas for meeting the heating demands. 85% of the houses in the UK are connected to the gas grid, making switching to alternatives expensive and disruptive for residents. 40% of industrial energy consumption is met by natural gas. A few themes emerge from heat decarbonization studies. Electrification suggests switching to heat pumps and electric storage heating, while the use of low carbon hydrogen allows the use of existing gas distribution network. Improving the energy efficiency of the housing stock is considered essential in reducing the overall demand 
which has wider system benefits. District heat could be used for urban areas where the source of heat could be industrial waste heat, combined heat and power, or large-scale heat pumps. Other options include solar, biomass, geothermal, but are selectively deployed. The diversity of options and specific advantages of one over the other, which in some cases might be regional, while others it's systemic, creates uncertainty for Ian the investor and Polo the policymaker. And although cost effectiveness is considered a metric to financially evaluate options, the most cost effective pathway may not be the most rewarding pathway. It therefore becomes important to assess the economic opportunities that lie in decarbonizing heating and how they are impacted by different pathways. To determine these opportunities, a number of value pools were considered and they represent opportunities in the industrial and residential sectors. Within each value pool, the costs and benefits arising from the chain of activities relating to it are calculated. For example, let's consider thermal storage. The benefits of integration of thermal storage into district heat schemes are related to the decoupling of thermal generation from heat demand. This allows extra electricity sale revenue from combined heat and power plant, electricity cost savings from district heat schemes which are based on heat pumps, and extra revenue from the sale of district heat from industrial waste heat. The cost to the systems include heat storage costs and heat recovery costs. Uh, in the case of the industrial waste heat. The net of this yields the total value. So how much is this value? The value pools are mapped across different scenarios and these scenarios are based on the National Grid Future Energy Scenarios and the Bayes 2050 calculator. The underlying narrative of each of the scenarios is shown on the x-axis. While electrification has a annual value of 13 billion, hydrogen has 28 billion. However, this is not enough for Ian and Polo to make any decision. An important aspect to compare is the scenario resilience, or how well do these value pools perform across scenarios. A low scenario resilience means uncertainty and dependence on pathways. Thus, it needs policy support to reduce the long-term long -term asso uncertainty associated with it. This study gives both Ian and Polo a different perspective on pathways to decarbonizing heat and has some recommendations for future action. Housing retrofits have wider benefits and therefore need to be an early policy priority with a focus on whole house retrofits. Policy support for low carbon heating technologies needs to extend beyond loans and grants and stimulate business model innovation. These could be related to business models which provide heat as a service or provide the heating equipment on subscription to reduce upfront costs for the end consumers. Talking about consumers, policy initiatives would also focus on increasing consumer awareness while providing incentives for, to stimulate uptake. Current market mechanisms do not support the industrial switch to hydrogen. Carbon pricing along with end consumer incentives for low carbon products will enable industries to switch. Develop a market for smart heat pumps and ensure standards for consumer protection will build trust among consumers to drive the uptake higher. As we decarbonize heating, there will be sectors which will be hard to decarbonize. And in the quest for a net zero economy, the role of greenhouse gas removal technology cannot be undermined. But where does the value lie in this market? Andrea will tell you more about that. Thank you, Abbas. Um, my research indeed aims to look at how nature could help develop a market for negative emission technologies. So as stressed by the IPCC, there is an urgent need to deploy greenhouse gas removal solutions to reach the 12 gigaton CO2 sequestration rate already by 2050, in order to likely limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, the current removal rate is on the order of a few kilotons per annum and the current lack of coordination and dedicated regulatory and enabling frameworks make it a high risk sector to invest in. In order to address the development of the GGR sector, I put myself in the shoes of the evolutionary governance framework represented by policymakers, industry, developers and investors, and I embarked on a journey along the transition pathway of GGR innovations. By analyzing the current GGR market barriers and projecting a technologies deployment, 
Nature-based solutions were estimated to be the likely fastest accelerating GGR solutions. The rapid market development could consolidate the MBS niches in a structure less susceptible to external pressures indeed, enabling the market actors to align around the socioeconomic benefits of MBS and share the lessons learned through the deployment of feasibility, desirability and viability mechanisms. For the sharing of lessons learned from nature-based projects, the market actors could co-evolve to ease the industry's responsibilities towards the development of more capital-intensive geological-based solutions. But where does the learning process uh, originate from? Well, the GGR uh, niche development is based on the establishment of solid supporting mechanisms necessary to overcome the economic, technical and social barriers that are common to all GGR technologies. For interviews and a desktop-based research, I identified the viability, feasibility and desirability main market barriers, namely the high costs, low account accuracy and acceptance, and I associated them with the corresponding enabling mechanisms uh, necessary to unlock the socioeconomic public and private benefits of MBS. The next step of the journey was then to parameterize the size of the required market actions by identifying the actors' roles in future possible GGR market arrangements. So such market arrangements were projected according to three different possible technology deployment scenarios to achieve net zero uh, by 2050. Plant, that is based on a high MBS uptake and batch deployment. Fuel, focusing on the production of biosynthetic fuels. Rock, based on the later riskier development of geological sequestration solutions without the prior um, MBS uptake. So as shown in the graph, a decarbonization pathway based on the second scenario could generate the most revenue opportunities. This could also be more resilient to market variations. So as for the individual business models, GGR technologies that chemically capture CO2 from the atmosphere entailed the largest revenues, but also the greatest losses throughout the period, and especially in 2050, as shown on the right side of the graph. Only vertically integrated backs and existing gas plants uh, that are retrofitted with uh, carbon capture systems could be profitable throughout the period 2020 to 2050. So in order to be profitable, direct air capture and gasification business models should be associated with the reutilization of the captured CO2 for the production of fuels. As for MBS instead, uh, the, the accessible revenues could be on the order of million rather than billion pounds per year. However, the low costs could provide higher returns on investments already in the short term and more evidently in 2050 in all three scenarios, as long as the ecosystem benefits are monetized. The governance framework would be required to evolve differently in the three scenarios in order to enable the constructed market opportunities. This roadmap suggests the rollout of the least cost mechanisms necessary to unlock the access to the most profitable business models. As stressed initially, indeed, the early development of a natural based product market could enable a circular economy necessary for the renewable fuel production while limiting the requirements of new mechanisms for the later deployment of uh, geological sequestration technologies. So through the imminent development of a diverse portfolio of technologies of MRV, waste and social legitimacy regulations, policymakers could indeed provide market certainty necessary to direct R&D programs and monitoring methods improvements while incentivizing private investments in NBS, in particular um, through the aviation sector's catalyzing role under the um, Corsia program. So furthermore, the continuous revision of the renewable transport fuel obligation to lower the aviation's risks in driving the uptake of renewable fuels, therefore increasing the likelihood of the aviation's fundamental capacity building role in developing the geological civilization market. So digging more into nature-based solutions, um, my colleague Aitana is now going to investigate how the livestock sector could contribute to the achievement of the net zero target in the UK. Thank you. So let's dig deeper to the role of the livestock sector in achieving net zero. As Andrea has mentioned, negative emission technologies will be essential to achieve net zero by 2050. However, this might pose a challenge for the UK as applying bioenergy and forestry is in direct resource competition with other sectors for land, water and crop use. The biggest competitor is the livestock sector, 
in which farmers such as Phoebe have done much to progress towards mitigating climate change in the past three decades. Phoebe has struggled to take up environmental policies as they do not contemplate her latent negative attitudes towards them and do not address her concerns. Therefore, I decided to focus my research on social legitimacy, analyzing the acceptance, fairness and trust of land reduction targets in order to help Polo frame some policy which would be successful and which Phoebe would be happy to implement. I did a social legitimacy analysis through investigating current policies as well as the targets that the CCC have proposed for land reduction and the practices, rewards and support schemes which could deliver these targets. The attitudes of Phoebe's colleagues were report, recorded through an online self-administered questionnaire which followed the social science standards and included LAM's approach to analysing social legitimacy. So not only did I analyse individuals' values, beliefs and culture, but also their relationship with institutions and within the community. The main variables which affect social legitimacy were determined through factor analysis and then correlations and discussions with Phoebe's colleagues allowed me to establish what are the barriers and drivers of social legitimacy and acceptance. Overall, my study helped raise the concerns of the farming community on the impact of the livelihood and also emphasize how it will be essential for other policies to consider net, uh, social legitimacy. The study helped me create a set of recommendations for policymakers. The first recommendation I gave to Polo was limiting antibiotic usage, as the consequences of zoonotic diseases are currently very present in our day-to-day -day life, need I say COVID. I also recommended that Polo advocated for practices such as land grazing improvement, breeding productivity improvements, and catchment sensitive farming, as this, this was most, more effect, as accepted by Phoebe and her colleagues. Phoebe and her colleagues also said they would be more willing to accept policies which, in which they were involved earlier on in the decision-making process. Another driver of acceptance was awareness. The more Phoebe knew about a practice, the more she was willing to implement it. If Polo alternatively wanted to implement uh, practices such as shifting to horticulture or shifting to the meat's alternative supply chain, which was met with a lot of opposition by Phoebe and her colleagues, I recommended that he clearly communicated the long-term benefits this would suppose to their communities. The biggest barrier I found in my study towards acceptance was the initial perceptions that Phoebe and her colleagues had towards environmental policies. For example, if Phoebe had not done anything to reduce her greenhouse gas emissions in the last few years and thought this was not important, she would not apply the land use policies. I think the main outtake of this uh, study was that Polo should. I think the main output of this study was that Polo should frame policy from a more holistic perspective. Now, Ellie will also delve in how this is also a key concept in greenhouse gas removal in hard to decarbonize sectors. Thank you, Aitana. So my research will evaluate the strategic fit of Rolls-Royce for the development of a market for greenhouse gas removal technologies. Climate change threatens to expose businesses to even greater systemic risk than the current COVID-19 pandemic has. These threats include rising capital costs, shrinking market share, access to future finance and subsequent technology stranding and shifts in consumer behaviour. In order to remain relevant, industry actors like Issue Here will need to engage in the net zero agenda. It's been highlighted already today that greenhouse gas removal technologies will be required in order to achieve the 2050 net zero target. However, there is currently no market for these technologies and that is limiting the scale at which they can be deployed. So my research evaluated the capability of Rolls-Royce, a FTSE 100 engineering company, to grow a greenhouse gas removal market, showing issue here how hard to decarbonise sectors can continue to operate in net zero futures. I developed three sequential strategies for Rolls-Royce to pivot their current business model to. 
The first strategy looked at Rolls-Royce outsourcing investment in carbon offsets in order to address the company's Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions. The second strategy looked at Rolls-Royce adopting certain technologies that would be relevant to their portfolio, not only allowing to address the company's Scope 1 and 2 emissions, but to also allow access to new revenue streams, including sustainable fuels. The third strategy took the second strategy one step further to incorporate greenhouse gas removal technologies into a Rolls-Royce sale to enable a net zero sale. This would allow to address the company's scope three emissions. To assess the robustness of these strategies, all three lenses of the human-centered design approach were applied in order to understand the financial viability, the technology, uh, regulatory and policy feasibility and the business desirability to engage in one of these strategies. As Andrea mentioned earlier, three net zero scenarios were explored. Here's the time horizon for the fuel focus scenario, showing how Rolls-Royce can progress with greenhouse gas removal technologies. Executing each strategy in sequence, starting from the investor offset through to net zero as a service, will allow for risk to be managed and investment opportunities to be realized as the greenhouse gas removal technologies mature in scale. This would enable Rolls-Royce to gain a foothold in and shape the market with a view to transitioning to becoming a service provider. Various business models were explored in this research. The gasification business model that focused on uh, biofuel production was found to be the most profitable. Executing the net zero as a service strategy could allow for potential profits of 440.2 billion pounds globally to be captured. Providing low or zero carbon power would um, to greenhouse gas removal manufacturers would provide Rolls-Royce with um, access to entry to a market that they are already familiar with. This would be through the power systems or the small modular reactors divisions by taking a joint venture or complete acquisition approach, allowing for risk to be shared to gain access to new skill sets and to accelerate entry into markets. So to conclude, my research has shown issue that realization of the value that can be captured, captured from greenhouse gas removal technologies will allow for businesses in those hard to decarbonize areas to remain relevant and operate in net zero futures. However, there are risks associated with heavy reliance on greenhouse gas removal technologies, which Addy will now talk to you about. Thank you, Ellie. As mentioned earlier, in May 2019, the UK Committee of the Climate Change published a net zero report to the UK government on timing and the possible scenario for the UK to set the net zero target. The report is analyzing the UK capacity and recommended scenario to achieve net zero based on nine academic sec economic sectors, as you saw in the middle graph. So based on those scenarios, as shown on the left graph, the role of greenhouse gas removal or GGR through bags, direct air capture or industrial carbon capture and storage across all the sector is very significant. It expected to capture 40% of the total carbon emission by 2050, which is around 175 million ton CO2. In spite of the CCS technology deployment in the UK and the high cost of the bags and direct air capture, the scenario developed by the CCC is rely on the GGR technology to achieve the net zero target. However, in other hand, as shown in the right graph, the aviation sector is not projected to reduce its carbon emission rapidly. And for Ian, as an investor, this is a concern for him on how his investment on aviation industry will support an UK decarbonization target. Based on those projections, the aviation sector is expected to reduce the net emission only 20% from 2017 level. A high level of remaining CO2 is expected from aviation sector, which is around 30 million tons CO2, or around 25% from the total UK remaining emission by 2050. From this background, the research aims to evaluating the UK net zero scenario and to evaluate if the requirement for GGR has been overstated due to the underestimation of aviation sector's potential to reduce its emission and then also to evaluate if the GGR will act as a hedging strategy for other sectors that fail to meet their emission reduction scenario. The research aim <clears throat> achieved by fulfill three objectives. 
The first objective is to evaluate the individual sector portfolio performance by four sustainability indicators, which are carbon abatement, land footprint, cost of abatement, and technology readiness level, which determine their environmental, technical, and economic viability. The second objective is to enhance the role of aviation sector on the scenario and compare with the original CCC scenario. This is to show the potential of the aviation sector to decarbonize. And this scenario is taken from the Sustainable Aviation Decarbonization Roadmap Report. In this scenario, the aviation sector is able to deliver a rapid emission reduction and assess the feasibility of the potential deployment of sustainable aviation fuel that alone can expect it to reduce 32% emission from aviation sector. Furthermore, a risk-based framework is built based on the latest, latest sector performance indicator and confirm with interview with groups of experts from each sectors, uh, such as the industrial experts, academia, as well as the CCC specialists. GGR is expected to act as a backstop for other sectors that fail to achieve their carbon reduction scenario. The strategy commonly used as a risk management strategy or commonly named as a hedging strategy to reduce the exposure to various risks. The role of hedging strategy is determined from the risk level from each sector to achieve the decarbonization scenario. The higher the risk from each sector, the more likely the hedging scenario is required. The result of this research is expected to answer the question of the contribution from aviation sector and how the GGR can act as a hedging strategy. Using the sustainable aviation scenario to enhance the original scenario, it reduced the requirement of GGR to 20 to 50% from the original CCC scenario. However, if we dive deeper into each sector, there are some sectors that have high risk to accomplish their net zero scenario target. The higher risk of each sector, so that the possibility of that sector not to achieve the carbon abatement target is then higher. In this case, GGR is required as a hedging from other sectors that might fail due to the high risk exposure. And this is some finding of the net zero risk from some sectors. For example, the carbonization in domestic heating, it requires from the scenario around 19 million heat pumps to be installed in homes. The rate of deployment is still substantial and is likely a barrier to adoption due to high cost of purchase and installation. As shown in the risk exposure from other sectors is high due to several uncertainty that lays on each of the sector measures. The development of GGR is required to act as a hedging measure and it should be developed to the scale and within the net zero time frame in order to accomplish the UK net zero goal. Based on this risk assessment result, follow our policymaker will be able to put his priority on measure that still have the high risk to achieve its decarbonization scenario. And later, with respect with the greenhouse gas technology, hereafter, Omar will present more details the study of the direct air capture technology for sin fuel production. Thank you, Adi. Uh, my research involves a techno-economic assessment of direct air capture for synthetic fuel production. Um, direct air capture is a greenhouse gas removal, and as my colleague said, greenhouse gas removal is more imperative now than ever. Direct air capture is an upcoming technology and is mentioned in the reports by the IPCC, the CCC, and the Royal Society. There are a limited number of developments globally, none of which have their technology in the commercial stage. The advantages of Dark Air Chapter is it offers scalable solutions. Unlike BEX or afforestation, little land is required and little resources. Capture CO2 can then has multiple applications such as storage, fuel production, carbonating beverages, and enhanced oil recovery. In a technology which is still relatively new, how can individuals such as ISHU, our industrial actor, Ian, our investor, or Paula, our policymaker, know how to develop direct air capture to implement this in the UK. To begin with, we look at how direct air capture works. Direct air capture separates CO2 from air using electricity from any source. In my case, I use UK grid electricity, and this can be used for storage, uh, for sequestration, sorry, or synthetic fuel production. My technical approach is assessed through a life cycle assessment. Uh, the results for the synthetic fuel production indicate that 4.5 tons of CO2 are emitted per ton of CO2 captured, meaning that this is um, technically unfeasible. As shown on the left graph, uh, this is mostly driven by electricity consumption, which is due to the high consumption of electricity by the electrolyzer, which 
uses over 90% of the system's electricity. This was investigated further. For the system to be feasible, electricity carbon intensities of less than 12 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour must be used. Currently in the UK, we are around 250 grams of, kilo, uh, 250 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, meaning this is only feasible in countries such as Norway, Finland, or Iceland. On the right-hand side for the carbon sequestration system, it can be seen that 0.45 tons of CO2 are emitted per ton captured, meaning the technology itself is feasible. However, in this case, natural gas is the leading contributor of the emissions. My research indicated that using a fully electric system decreases emissions by almost 50%. The economic, assistant, uh, the economic assessment began with looking at single uh, facilities over their lifetimes. The net present value of the system was found to be highly profitable for the synthetic fuel production. Um, however, this is highly dependent on the synthetic fuel wholesale price, which currently does not exist. Um, in the case of carbon sequestration, this was found to have a negative net present value. This is, like, this is due to low carbon pricing mechanisms here in the UK. And this was studied further to investigate what carbon pricing would we need for it to be uh, to have a positive NPV. And it's found to be over 660 pounds per ton of CO2 between now and 2050, which is highly unlikely um, as current carbon pricing is, is around 18 pounds per ton of CO2. The levelized cost of capture is a metric used by investors and developers that compares uh, different GGR technology on a basis of per ton of, ca per ton of CO2 captured. Uh, it was higher for the synthetic fuel production system, mostly due to this high electricity consumption. Um, as um, done by Andrea, I studied three scenarios which assumed the, uh, the same uh, assumptions um, in his study, um, in the sense of looking at uh, economic feasibility for reaching next zero. The results for the synthetic fuel production showed that all scenarios were almost profitable, especially the rock and fuel. However, plant was not very profitable as it had low um, prevalence in the UK. In the case of carbon sequestration, it was found to be um, unprofitable over all three scenarios. Um, so what does Polo, what can Polo, our policymaker, do? Um, firstly, we could have improved carbon pricing mechanisms, which would uh, support our carbon sequestration system. Secondly, guaranteed loans and green bonds could be used um, to help developers such as Daniel uh, develop these technologies. Thirdly, uh, research and development and government support could be used to uh, give companies uh, support uh, to develop different uh, direct air capture system. And finally, fuel standard regulations such as the California low carbon fuel um, standards, which creates a trading mechanism and regulations uh, for having uh, fuel emissions um, around a certain level. And now my colleague Faisal will describe how synthetic fuels can be used in industry. Thank you, Omar. As part of the industrial energy transition, and uh, I will be discussing quantifying the potential of fuel switching in industrial energy systems on a micro scale. So, as my colleague Abbas mentioned earlier, that the root of industrial emissions comes from a staggering energy demand as high as 37%, which contributed to 25% of the global emissions. In the UK, two thirds of industrial emissions are from eight industrial sectors, mainly contributed from iron and steel, cement, chemicals, and oil refining. The aims of my study was for overall industry decarbonization and reduction in emissions, where it narrows down to system modifications and integration of low to zero carbon fuels through a methodology developed for process fuel switching. The methodology, as shown in the right, begins by designing a utility system using software. The model provides details of fuel and technology data, as well as steam flows and system simulation results. The user can interpret new data and modify the design according to any fuel switching scenario. Costs and emissions are then recorded, and with a reference to a base system, results are used to find annualized abatement costs and emission reduction potentials, which are plotted in a marginal abatement cost curve. The research targets include um, industries uh, where the research targets industries with indirect heating, which is a common process in various industry sectors. And due to legacy systems being mostly non-optimized with high waste heat, industry personnel like Issue can benefit from the case study undertaken, which goes through a hierarchy of four systems that go from a non-optimized system to optimize with waste heat utilization 
and finally linking those with fuel system uh, fuel switching system adjustments. Uh, the case study as shown has four systems um, with the main distinction between those in optimization and waste heat recovery. Those systems were used in five different scenarios attributed to each fuel as shown, including hydrogen gas, biomethane, electricity, biomass, and natural gas. While maintaining production and adequate steam flow, the scenarios included partial switching, replacing one out of two system boiler fuels and full switching, replacing all system fuels. And yeah, so the results acquired from those were interpreted annually in terms of costs, emissions, and further used to plot marginal abatement cost curves. MAC curves are a powerful tool when it comes to compa comparing a variety of options, helping policymakers like Polo and industry people like Issue to distinguish the most appropriate option for their application. The height of each block represents the cost, while the width shows the associated abatement potential. As an example, the curve on the left includes all fuels considered in the in all four system configurations with a 70 percent substitution rate of one boiler fuel initially using fuel gas results show that a system oriented approach using hydrogen can reduce up to 120,000 tons of co2 returning 120 pounds a ton with the same configuration fully switching the system to hydrogen mitigates up to 130,000 tons of CO2 at an annual return of, a, I mean, at a return of 100 pounds per ton. And so, in conclusion, when it came when it came to emissions, both partial and full switching showed tremendous potential for reduction in emissions, where results show reduction as high as 90% from fully switching with hydrogen. However, those reductions are only effective when coupled with reasonable costs, and therefore. Those costs did show financial benefit, with the highest uh, shown emerging from a system-oriented design as well. And therefore, optimization, direct heat recovery, and waste heat utilization are the essence of the system-oriented approach and have a major influence on the performance of all fuels. A correlation between emissions and costs with substitution rates makes full fuel switching more impactful towards the overall research aim. And moving forward with fuel switching it is best when combined with low emission industrial processes, whether by avoiding CO2 or using fossil fuel with technologies such as carbon capture and storage, waste heat utilization, or even cogeneration. And lastly, electricity as a low emission option or heat electrification, it was hindered by high electricity costs. And therefore, policymakers such as Polo must consider that electrified and sustainable industrial heating relies on renewable based strategy with a low emission grid and speaking of fuels and high emission industries my colleague Dylan is going to focus on the oil industry where and discuss the current energy transition possibilities thank you Faisal now I'll be highlighting how oil majors can adapt to the impending energy transition now as my colleagues have touched upon there are a myriad of pathways in which the world may follow to realize this 1.5 C goal. And underpinning these pathways are projections with respect to oil demand. Now, it is clear that deep uncertainty is inherent across all these scenarios, thus posing a risk to oil companies, especially the majors, and to our investor Ian's current investment portfolio. Now, even with these clear signals, majors failed to realize any significant move in the low carbon sector that would prove resilient to oil demand shocks. Noticing this, Ian grows anxious and exclaims, Houston, we have a problem. Now we all know it. Investors, they hate risk, and they would want a robust portfolio on missed uncertainty that would produce stable returns. And with this, and with respect to the oil majors, three key questions Ian can draw from. First of which being, what are these robust strategies that majors can realize across different scenarios. Secondly, whether there's, there's some sort of first low carbon mover advantage. And lastly, are European firms, given their greater low carbon portfolios, better prepared for uncertainty than their American major peers? Well, to start with, let's, let's look at how you train your dog. Now, this is the premise for reinforcement learning in which the agent, your dog, receives an observation from yourself being the environment. And upon good action, a reward is received. Now, extending this to the multi-agent setting doesn't just mean that we get multiple dogs, but the fact that we can combine 
deep neural networks and multi-agent systems, thus creating deep multi-agent reinforcement learning that can solve games at a superhuman level. And with this, this would be the first step in solving for robustness. And using, utilizing this technique, a model was developed. The model was initialized with the environment created by the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program and E3G's Two Degrees Pathway War Game. Observations mimic real life scenarios in which majors have incomplete information about the environment and their other competitors. Regarding actions, actions span across oil, gas, and green markets, as well as cash borrowing and player-to-player -player trading. And lastly, the reward function is designed in parallel with the goals of a large publicly traded oil company, as well as the investor, Ian, to maximize dividend payouts. Now, with this, with this model, as well as real initialized data, we have results. Across all scenarios, we find that Exxon pays the most dividends while maintaining a realistic strategy pathway. In order to dig deeper into the strategy pathways, four key assets are delved into. The first of which being oil. We find that oil makes significant divestments from oil early on, thus exploiting short-term returns in order to gain advantage in other markets. Now moving on to gas, we find that there's a gradual increase in gas investment, highlighting a probable net income reliance, stable net income reliance over time. And onto green markets, we find significant early first move behavior across all majors. And this continues throughout the entirety, entirety of the game with BP and Exxon taking lead as the green movers. Another interesting asset to view is debt accumulation over time. Interestingly, this coincides with green asset spending, suggesting a leverage transition play taking place. In other words, cash borrowing to buy large amounts of green assets. Now, with these findings, we have robustness and can answer those three key questions Ian has. The first of which being a robust strategy is a green strategy. One, there's little net income reliance on oil assets. However, there is a slight increase in gas asset accumulation. Moreover, we find that moving first and moving strong proves a robust strategy over time as this takes advantage of accumulating higher returns in the long term, thus mitigating substantial levels of debt. And lastly, we find that Americans can still remain on top despite their European peers' greater low carbon asset portfolios. This is because such large oil reserve companies such as Exxon can leverage their short-term returns realized in oil markets to to gain an, oil, uh, an early domination uh, through purchasing green assets with leverage. Now, with these insights, our investor Ian can adjust his portfolio accordingly, and thus want, hoping to generalize his investment strategy, he looks to Amer, who will look at how decarbonization will, will span across the entirety of industries in the UK. Thank you, Dylan. As we can see in these beautiful graphics, these industries are one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, and they too must decarbonize in a net zero future. Therefore, my thesis will explore a top level analysis of business model to support the decarbonization of these industrial clusters and to, to not cause our industrial actor issue millions and millions of pounds in investment. So in the UK or in the world, industry accounts for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions and they are often located in close proximity to one another in what is called industrial clusters. And in those clusters, they benefit from um, industrial symbiosis, which is the exchange of fuels, products, um, and materials um, between amongst each other. Um, and business models are defined a way in which um, the industry does a business. So a business model innovation defines a way where a business changes the way that they do, um, they, they do their work in um, a net zero future. Um, it is believed that business models um, uh, can accelerate the uptake of, of innovative technologies, including decarbonization technologies, um, such as the ones explored in this presentation. Our businessman, Benoit, has a lot of business models applied in other sectors of the economy. Therefore, I use those learnings to obtain my business models uh, for in the decarbonization of industrial clusters. Business models are evaluated in three ways in the value proposition, in the value delivery, and in the value creation. And this is how I created the business models for my thesis. 
Now, if Ishu wants to decarbonize, what can he do? So there's three main pathways he can go down. Either he keeps the existing process if he doesn't want to buy or invest in new technologies, and he can use CCS or carbon capture and storage. He can also go down the route of improving energy efficiency. Or if he wants to change the existing process, he can use uh, fuel switching such as biomass or hydrogen or electrification. And these are the main pathways that are explored in my thesis. And here are the 10 business models um, that I have created, and they each relate to a different decarbonization pathway or a different cluster, um, and they can be shortlisted depending on the cluster of choice or the choice of decarbonization pathway. And this is what I explore in the next few slides of my presentation. Here's the UK. We've got about seven different um, industrial clusters, and the cluster that I chose is the Merseyside cluster, which is in the Liverpool um, Bay area. And um, uh, they, ch they chose a CCS with hydrogen infrastructure for their decarbonization pathway. And it was evaluated um, both qualitatively and quantitatively in terms of the business model. So in the qualitative analysis, I used a financial analysis. Um, the, the fee that is paid um, by the cluster, um, so each industry, how much he pays every year, and the price of the fuel um, per megawatt um, delivered. And the quantitative side, I use the SWOT analysis um, to um, see what any external or internal uh, opportunities and strengths and weaknesses and threats that can happen to issues business. So now the business models can be shortlisted. For this specific cluster, the three main business models that I will investigate included the decarbonization as a service, where you've got a service provider and independent actor that provides that solution to issue as a service. The system orchestrator who bundles the different actors together um, and delivers that service also to issue. And the last one is the provider side. So this is the case of a bigger utility, um, for example, British Gas delivering um, a solution to different clusters um, within the area, maybe South Wales as well as Liverpool. And here are the results. On the left, we can see that um, the provider side decarbonization model gives the lowest annual fee payable by issue and the lowest levelized cost of hydrogen per megawatt. On the right, we can see the sensitivity analysis where um, the price uh, that is paid by issue every year is very sensitive to the payback period, but not as sensitive to a change in the carbon tax. So if a payback period is larger, for example, 20 years, it's better for issue, but it's worse for our investor, Ian. Um, and so even though the provider side model is the best um, uh, financially, it is not the best logistically because there's already established actors in Merseyside who are actually um, going to benefit from decarbonizing uh, in the system orchestrator business model. So for Merseyside, this is the best model that was selected. Going into our recommendations, a lot of the risks were mitigated through business model innovation. So issues should definitely use that when he's decarbonizing his industry. And the clusters are a key asset that are tapped into in the choice of this decarbonization pathway. Pathway, So this should never be missed. And lastly, um, a lot of those early decarbonization benefits are reaped when issue decarbonizes now rather than waiting for the technologies to become cheaper. And he can actually make, save some money. At the beginning, we showed you what each of those actors came to the table and we asked you, what can they bring? Well, everyone can bring their new, uh, the new perspectives and table. First of all, Polo, our policymaker, uh, can bring policies to adapt the electricity markets towards sustainable technologies. He can also implement uh, carbon pricing mechanisms and introduce some fuel regulations to help those industries decarbonize. He can also support the business model of uh, um, low carbon heat technologies through the policies that he brings in. He can set clear environmental targets um, to provide market certainty for those investors. And he can consider social legitimacy when it comes to creating his policy. Our farmer FEV needs to be more engaging with the policy in the policy making process and voice the requirements of this agricultural sector. Our businessman Benoit needs to take into account the changing electricity market in the market transition in order to implement successful um, businesses and utilize the importance of those business model innovations to successfully meet the targets while maintaining the profitability. Our investor Ian can diversify into low carbon business models to maintain his competitiveness and relevance in the net zero future. Our developer, Danielle, can explore new technologies and be the pioneer of decarbonization. And lastly, our industry actor issue, he has to realize that decarbonizing is crucial to remain relevant in the net zero future. 
and he can optimize his existing processes of energy efficiency and implementing new technologies. Decarbonizing early for issue through business model innovations can make him actually competitive in the market. Once those people come together with their different goals, and if they look from the lens of social desirability, technical feasibility, and financial viability, they can achieve new targets without stepping on each other's toes because of a holistic, holistic approach is the only way to go towards a net zero or decarbonized future. Thank you all for listening and we'll be open to some questions. Um, and these are some of the um, industries and companies that have supported us throughout our um, thesis 